Yesterday's attempted walk back of his comments standing next to Vladimir Putin is not the first time we've seen President Trump in damage control mode. Take his explanation for not rejecting the support of David Duke and the KKK. Will you unequivocally condemn David Duke and say that you don't want his vote or that of other white supremacists in this election? Well, just so you understand, I don't know anything about David Duke, okay? Okay, I mean, I'm just talking about David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan here, but... I don't know. Any, honestly, I don't know David Duke. He yeah. says, I'm just in, talking in meantime, about David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan here. And you said, honestly, I well, don't know let, David let Duke. You. OK, so let me tell you, I'm sitting in a house in Florida with a very bad earpiece that they gave me. And you could hardly hear what he was saying. Except he repeated David Duke's name in his answer to Jake Tapper or the president's 360 on who deserved blame in Charlottesville. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides, on many sides. As I said on Saturday, we condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence. It has no place in America. You had a group on one side that was bad, and you had a group on the other side that was also very violent. And nobody wants to say that, but I'll say it right now. I think there's blame on both sides. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. I only tell you this, there are two sides to a story. That was last summer after Charlottesville. Then we talk about how he waited and reportedly tested the waters before reacting to his reported s-hole countries comment. President Trump slams immigrants from, and these are his words, s-hole countries. And here's the thing, the White House is not denying it. According to our White House correspondents, quote, two sources close to the administration told NBC News Trump worked the phones Thursday night calling friends and allies outside the White House to gauge reaction to fallout from the blank hole comments. One source characterized Trump as seeking reassurance. Another source told NBC News the president sought insight about how the episode might resonate among his base of supporters. 15 hours after the Washington Post published a story, Trump's now denying that he used those words. Joining us now is the co-founder of Axios, Mike Allen. This morning, Axios is looking at how Republicans are reacting to President Trump's cleanup efforts. Mike, good morning. Always good to see you. Morning, boy. So we look at Charlottesville. The president's cleanup included the term on both sides. And yesterday, as he said, yes, I agree with my intelligence services, that Russia meddled in the 2016 election. Going out on a limb there. Then the ad lib was, could be other people, a lot of people, other people out there. He never gives you a clean explanation or a clean apology or a clean clarification for what he meant. No, of course not, because he doesn't believe it. Right. And you see this uh, behind the scenes, the staff agrees on what they're gonna say, and he goes out and it's his way of rebelling. It's his way of saying, I'm doing this because I have to, but I'm gonna take it back. And I can tell you, lawmakers that we talked to, not a single one of them believes that he said would when he meant wouldn't. And behind the scenes, they will tell you his comments are unfathomable, they're unexplainable, they're un-American. But as we've seen, like they won't go on screen to say it. The only people saying it, people leaving the stage. So we should believe him the first time is what you're saying. Uh, believe what he says the first time because it's what he actually thinks yeah, no, before I, I, he's forced to walk it back. That's right. So Mike, so, so Mike, what's the cumulative effect of this? Not only in terms of his staff, the folks who are around him, but the cumulative effect of the kind of repeated line the repeated walk back uh, for, for American democracy generally. What do you think is the, is the effect of all of this? Well, yeah, that's that distortion force field that Barnacle was talking about at the top of the show, that you get Republican lawmakers who uh, come out and they will barely uh, say that they disagree or say the least that they have to. And uh, we learned that the reason that he went out and did this turnaround uh, cleanup was that uh, they were worried there'd be a little bit more from the Hill, that some of the people had started to speak up just after they did, after Charlottesville, they said there could be more of that. So his sole audience yesterday was the Hill. That's why he took it back. And that's why when we see his tweets this morning, he doesn't believe it. So Kristen Soltis Anderson, let's just talk about this, what we saw yesterday as a communication strategy of Bill Shine, new to the uh, to his position in the communication shop, formerly of, of Fox News. 
And it seems to be they got in a room together and they decided, here's how we're going to explain this one after 24 hours of saying nothing. And it's going to be that you misspoke on one word <laughs> and that you, you were misunderstood, that you didn't conjugate a verb the way you meant to conjugate a verb. Is that really the best they can do? And is that really what the White House thought would convince the American public that, yes, the president of the United States does believe that Putin is a bad guy who meddled in our election? Well, there's a slice of Trump's base that no matter what the explanation had been, would have agreed with it, would have bought it, would have said, great, he's put this matter to bed. I think there's another slice of people they were trying to speak to, which are those who believe that Trump is prone to misspeaking. That's not a hard thing to believe, right? So in a way, they're trying to lean into a belief that already exists out there among people both who like and dislike the president, which is that he is sometimes prone to saying things that are not quite the eloquent way you'd want to say them. And because even those who really oppose the president are willing to believe that, I suspect that's why they thought this was the best communication strategy lean into something people already believe about the president mm. to try to make them believe something that is frankly hard to believe. And now we're seeing already today the president is tweeting again saying the media kind of pushed me into this. They wanted to see a boxing match. He's also tweeting about NATO. Just a few moments ago he tweeted this. While the NATO meeting in Brussels was an acknowledged triumph with billions of dollars more being put up by member countries at a faster pace, the meeting with Russia may prove to be in the long run an even greater success. Many positive things come out of that meeting. Russia has agreed to help with North Korea, where relationships with us are very good, and the process is moving along. There is no rush. The sanctions remain. Big benefits, an exciting future for North Korea at the end of the process. So you hopscotch from NATO to Russia to North Korea there. Steve Ratner, uh, you've got some charts with you. First of all, let's fact check because going back to what we heard him say to Tucker Carlson last night about NATO countries and the $44 billion number he's touting that he delivered. He just keeps making this stuff up. So he's been saying this repeatedly since the summit. And the best evidence that I can give you as to why it's not true is what uh, Macron of France said immediately after right. Trump said it. And I wrote the words down. He said, the communique is clear. It reaffirms our two, a commitment to 2% in 2024. That is all. And then with respect to Trump's claim that the U.S. bears the vast burden of NATO, he, contends, he confuses what countries spend on defense themselves versus what NATO spends. We only contribute 22 percent of NATO's actual budget. He says it's 90, 90 91. Right. Where he gets that number is a mystery. So to be clear, Steve, what he got a pledge from NATO countries as he left Brussels to live up to their 2% commitment, not to pay more than they'd already pledged to pay. He, he got a pledge for them to do what they already said they were going to do. Right. So if you want to call that a pledge, you can call that a pledge. All right, so what are we looking at in your chart? So look, uh, apropos that, it seemed like a good day to talk about Trump's lies in general. And we had some very good help from the folks at the Toronto Star, and I want to get these numbers right, who went through all 1,340,300 words that Trump has spoken or tweeted since his inauguration. Sounds fun. And they <laughs> must have been fun. <laughs> I assume there was some computer, computer help here. And they found uh, 1,929 false statements involving 68,928 words. But what's interesting about it, as you can see in the chart that's on the screen now, is if you track the trend of what he's saying, and this goes week by week, and those light gray bars in the back are how many false claims or lies he said each week. But the most interesting line is the red line that goes across the middle that shows the trend in what he's been saying. And so at the beginning of his administration, he was sort of in the eight lies per week category down here. And today, 18 months into his administration, he's in the 40 lies per category uh, here. And then, of course, you can see that the last few weeks have been a little tough for him. And so he's been lying, wow. uh, lying even wow. more. So, Steve, can I just ask, are these based on um on figures he stated as fact that weren't fact because he also says things like he said in one of these tweets it's an acknowledged fact that Brussels went well I mean that's not necessarily yeah no I don't think he's counting lie. that and in fact the, the Toronto Star is reasonably conservative the Washington Post has done a similar right. analysis and they actually got to 3,000 to uh, 3,251 lies so I think this is a pretty uh, tight group of lies now you may say well the number of lies is rising because he's talking more so you talk more you lie more However, if you compare the amount of lies to how much he talks, you see that the number of lies per word is also, uh, also going up. And so at the beginning of his term, about, again, let's focus on the red line, about 
of his words were part of a lie, and by the end of June, he was up to eight and a half percent of his words were part of a lie. And so he is lying more and more, even as he talks more and more, the proportion of lies is still, is still going up. And then lastly, we can, look at, uh, we can look at where these lies are occurring. And so you can start with speeches, 648 uh, speeches. Now you may say, well, speeches are written out, so how can there be lies in there? So either they're not fact-checked, or this is extemporaneous stuff that he's, that he's throwing in there. And then the other thing I thought was interesting were the interviews. So he's only given about 60 interviews. Half of those are with Fox. And he's lied an average of six and a half times per interview. So Nick Confessori, as you look at these numbers, it's almost hard to compute in 15% of his words and all, all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, he's, he repeats a lot of them, too, which is extraordinary. I, I'm thinking again about his line that he was the first Republican to win the state of Wisconsin, ignoring Ronald Reagan, of course, in 84, saying Reagan only lost Wisconsin. He knows it's false. He says it again and says it again. You know, the fact that we can even have this segment, right. <laughs> the fact that we can even do a statistical analysis by week of how often he lies, is a terrible and tragic commentary on the presidency, uh, and I, I, I can't even have fun with it. It's 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 terrible, and when I think about, if you compound that with the fact that his distortion bubble, as Mike calls it, drags everyone in his party along with it, um, you have a recipe for a real crack up in American politics. He is moving them off a commitment to facts, but he's also moving them off their own policies. He's going to have people saying collusion is actually fine. If Mueller comes out in six months and says that there's actually a conspiracy, there are going to be people in bars in Pennsylvania saying, well, you know what? It's not so bad. You know, you know, you know uh, Clinton was really bad. It was worth beating her. He, he is going to pull everything in that direction. This is entirely consistent with what we know about human behavior, which is that with any kind of habit or addiction, mm -hmm. if it isn't addressed, if it isn't called out, if it isn't treated, it gets worse. It's like that with adults, it's like that with children. And there's no one calling him out other than the media who he feels he's already handily discredited. And we've seen, you know, the point of that walk back, right, as Mike put it, was to give members of Congress and his party just a fig leaf to say, you know what, it's over. And we saw that yesterday. People like Bob Portman, Senator Portman, came out and said, you know what, I take him at his word. Yep. Case closed. That was the only purpose to that. It wasn't for the public. It wasn't for us. It was for Congress. And it worked. And it's not just that he gets away with it. He's rewarded for it. That's why you see this behavior going up. Like his hold on his party doesn't change. His hold on his uh, uh, base and the people out uh, in any place where there's a race doesn't change. And so that's why uh, you see this. And there's no one around him who can say, you just can't say that. Or, and the reason that we see those stats, like there isn't anyone around him who can say, like, this is the speech, we're going to stick to it. He goes out, they can have something in the prompter, but he goes out and says what he wants to. And a real change we've noticed in the last few few months. They don't even try to explain anymore. The staff just says, it's Trump. And you ask him what, what he's going to do, and they say, I don't know. And his argument, Kristen, is this is how I got elected, Trump being Trump. And it seems he's convinced many of his handlers and his aides that that's the best way to go. Well, and I think the reason, another reason that we haven't talked about quite yet, that folks on Capitol Hill have not been as vocal about pushing back against all of these times when the president says something that is provably false, is because I think there are a lot of Republicans on the Hill that may disagree with the president on trade. They may be horrified with where he stands on Russia. All of these positions the president takes that are very far outside the bounds of traditional Republican orthodoxy, they want to be able to hopefully try to influence this president. They view someone like a Jeff Flake or a Bob Corker as no longer having the opportunity to speak to the president and say, Mr. President, you've got it wrong on trade. Mr. President, you've got it wrong on Russia. Where if they stay silent, if they say, fine, I take him at his word, let's move on, they preserve that ability. I, I believe they think they preserve that ability to be able to go to the White House and say, Mr. President, I think you should do this differently, to be able to contact him privately or what have you. Uh, so I think that's another important thing to, to bear in mind. I think they just not only 
politically don't view it as, as beneficial to them to criticize the president because it's not going to change voters' minds. But I think they want to preserve the ability to try to change Trump's mind, even if that has not proven terribly successful in the past. Well, they've tried it. I'm thinking about the case of tariffs. They've all gone on mm -hmm. the record and say how bad tariffs are. Well, the president goes through with his tariffs anyway because in his gut he believes they're right. Kristen Soltis Anderson, thank you very much. Mike thank Allen, you. thank you as well. Thank we'll you, be reading Axios as we do every day. Coming up, the Washington Post Robert Costa takes us behind the scenes at the White House with his latest reporting on the fallout after Helsinki, including the private conversations that led to yesterday's walk back. That reporting is next on Morning Joe. <clears throat> Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.